Oh, I need to mention one thing. Please silence your cell phone. Looks different over here. Cool. Yes. That's nice. So, <clears throat> I'm Gary. I think, looking around, I think I know everybody. So, um, made up this goofy title for two reasons. What's this do? It's the slide manager. <laughs> cool. Um, I made up this title for two reasons. Um, First, this is going to be a little bit of a theme of what I'm going to talk about. And secondly, I just like goofy titles. So it makes people, gets their attention, right? So I want to give you a little bit of personal history I'm going to start out with to hopefully kind of explain why I think I've been very lucky. I've been fortunate with the, um, the way my career has gone that I do have the luxury of just essentially something strikes me as a peculiar thing I see in the puzzle. And then I've been able to just kind of um, work those out without, you know, and I'll have to explain to you how that happened because of the way my funding has worked through the years. But some um, history first. Um, this is Tony Sturgis. My, um, I met Tony when I was an undergraduate, actually, and started doing some work with him. And we were working on, is there a pointer here? And we were working on current meter data. In those days, continental shelf waves had really just been discovered a few, few years earlier. And so everybody in the world was all over continental shelf dynamics. So I was lucky to kind of get in on the beginning of that. And for the um, students here, my first paper, um, in Journal of Physical Oceanography, the top journal in our field, we had 21 days of data from two current meter moorings, each of which had two current meters, okay? And, but of course, that's worse than it sounds because we didn't have computers yet. <laughs> so we're doing the calculations on a TI hand calculator. Okay, so it's good and bad. We could get away with a paper with 21 days of data, but you know, but it took you two years to do the calculations on your hand calculator. Um, but shortly after, um, shortly after I got to grad school, um, I we had a new professor arrived, Alan Clark, and. I started doing this kind of work instead of the data. Um, Alan was actually an applied mathematician. And um, so that's kind of what I did for my um, dissertation. And part of the reason is, is because when you're doing this kind of thing, it requires using computers, which I despise, you know, especially in those days. <laughs> you know, those days, it's, it's much better now. But um, those days, so I decided I much preferred the paper and pencil sort of theory. But um, when it came to graduate school times, um, this picture's a little fuzzy, but it's the best one I could find. I was offered a couple of jobs, uh, faculty jobs out of grad school, but I decided to take a postdoc instead uh, for two reasons. First of all, given my graduate school background, I thought I really needed to kind of bolster my ability in data analysis. And a postdoc was a good way to do that. And Klaus Wertke uh, here was one of the top data people in the world and offered me a postdoc. And the second reason was, well, it's in Hawaii. <laughs> you know? I mean, so, and I was still surfing at the time, so I figured a couple of years in Hawaii sounds pretty good, you know? So um, <clears throat> now this solving puzzles thing, Klaus was using tide gauge data in the um, Pacific Ocean. And it really first showed the utility of the gauges for doing kind of what we call short-term climate variability. And so he had a thing called the TOGA Sea Level Center, Tropical Ocean Global Atmosphere. It's a 10-year program that was a major ocean atmosphere program, ran from 1975 to, uh, not, sorry, 1985 to 95, okay? And so this postdoc was um, part of that. And the nice thing about it is we were collecting all these um, tie gauge data. 
And then we had a data center where we collected tie gauge data from around the world. And the funding agency was actually perfectly happy to fund someone just to look at the data without any particular kind of emphasis. Just simply look at the data. The idea was the best quality control on data is to have some scientists looking at it. Okay, and that was it. So they were perfectly happy for somebody to just kind of muck about in the data. And so that was my job. So it was pretty cool. And so, so the first thing is, you know, that's what I'm saying about uh, my job was simply look at the data, find some puzzles, and try and solve them. Yeah. And the, the nice thing about TOGA, too, is that when you get to the end of TOGA, and you have the final meeting wrap-up after 10 years of TOGA, you have a TOGA party. <laughs> this was in Australia. And this is not me dancing. This is Joel Picot, actually, from Nemea. Not me dancing. It was about 30 degrees out that, uh, 30 degrees that night. And we're all in our togas and flip-flops, and this is a heater. That's what's really going on. <laughs> okay. So toga was a lot of fun. And for example, one of the kinds of puzzles that um, Klaus pointed out to me, you can't see it here, I'm sorry, this is a scan from an old paper, and this was um, hi a highlighted area, so you can't see the most interesting part here, but it's okay. Klaus, um, Klaus just came to my office one day and he said, you know, at Wake Island, out in the Western Pacific, every few years, intermittently, all of a sudden we get this two or three cycles, it's the largest signals in the data, two or three cycles of almost a perfect 90-day sinusoid. It goes on for two or three cycles, and then it goes away. And we don't see it again for years, and that's no obvious connection to anything. He says, you know, if you could figure this out, it'd be a nice little paper. So I said, okay. Uh, it took me eight years to figure it out, <laughs> and, which is true, but it's a nice little puzzle. Like I was saying, it took eight years. And part of the reason is, is that so this is how it got started in tide gauges. In the meantime, we started getting data from something called satellite altimeters. So where we could actually measure like a tide gauge, but everywhere in the ocean. And the first altimeter was in the mid 80s, called Geosat. And that's what finally allowed me to figure out what these things are, were. And it turns out that this is just looking at sea level height as a function of time and longitude. This is at the latitude of Wake Island and Hawaii, which are the same latitude. And we can see th this is Wake Island's latitude here. These kind of signals, you can track them back. They track back to the big island of Hawaii. Okay, we couldn't do this before because we didn't have the altimetry data. And this is, turns out there are um, eddies generated at the tip of the big island of Hawaii during El Nino events. And, but it takes them a year and a half to propagate over to Wake Island. So that why, that's why there was no obvious connection to El Nino. They weren't at the right time until you propagate them back. So anyway, so it took me eight years to write this, what Klaus said, a nice little paper. And, but the, it was also our first introduction to altimetry data. And sort of like with the tide gauge stuff, um, I was fortunate that I got my, was on the first um, altimetry team for the Topex Poseidon stuff that was in the late 80s, started in the late 80s. And I've been a member of that, a succession of these science teams from the late 80s until the most recent one was just funded a few months ago. So they recompete about every three years. And so the nice thing about this is that NASA funds these science teams primarily to make sure that people are using the data and that's the quality control and similar to what I was saying about the tide gauges. So again, I've been pretty lucky to be able to just kind of look at the data, find puzzles, and they're perfectly happy as long as you're publishing something about them, you know, occasionally. So again, it's been, I've been getting away with this for over 25 years now. And um, I just hope to be able to get away with it for another five or so and then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done. You know, it'll be, it'll be good. So the, um, this also, oh, sorry, I had another thing in here. <coughs> the fun thing about this is that I wrote this nice little paper, Big Island, Eddie, Propagate to Wake Island, very nice. So I had a master's student in Hawaii, um, Christina Munch, now Christina Holland, who did her PhD here after um, following me from Hawaii. And so I told her, you know, use the altimetry data and 
see if we can look at these, this eddy problem a little more carefully. And she found out that something interesting is that, you know, the eddies do get from the big island to wake, but they take a much more complicated path than you said in your paper. She basically, her paper proved mine wrong. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> Steve's going, all right, yeah. But, um, but that's good, another puzzle, right? The puzzle in this case was the, the path of the eddies, and the path they were taking was consistent with the theory that existed at that time for how eddies should propagate. So that was another puzzle, and it worked itself out into another substantial um, NASA proposal, and another couple of papers for Christina, and a whole other sort of research line that we had. All of this just because of that first puzzle that Klaus pointed out, and then just following it on and, and taking, this is now working on this problem for about 12 years. Uh, the lesson here is that one, I'm very slow, and two, though, I'm very persistent, <laughs> okay? So as long as you're persistent, slow is okay. Um, another puzzle Klaus pointed out to me. Klaus seemed to have a real knack for showing me some simple little problem that would take me eight or 10 years to solve. Okay? He was very, very good at that. Um, he came to me one time and said, another time and said, most of you here um, have had the core course now, so you've heard of tides, okay? And you know, the tides, we typically take a year's worth of data and we fit the tidal spectrum, all the different tides to it, and they're supposed to stay the same over time. You know, that's the whole idea, you know, the tides are um, always the same. But in fact, when you do this a year at a time and you do like, for example, the, do the dominant lunar tide, we call M2, when you look at the amplitude of it, it changes from year to year. Not a lot, you know, but measurably. And so Klaus brought this to me one day and he said, <laughs> Klaus was famous, remember I told you my background in grad school, right? Klaus would march into my office and Boris is thinking, oh my God, he was hard up. He, Klaus would say, he had a very strong German accent, I need a mathematician. <laughs> Boris is thinking, God, and he went to you? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but anyway, I was the best he had. So, um, so he brought, the, brought this thing in and he said, oh, I have an idea. He said, this year to year changes. He said, the, the height of the sea level changes year to year. So the depth of the water in the harbor changes year to year. And so is that causing this change in the tides? Well, you know, the depth is changing this much, you know, at low frequency. So I actually, I did the math. I worked it out, tried to figure it out. And I finally told him, I said, no, Klaus, it just doesn't work. And he goes, ah, all right, fine. Oh, another Klaus story. <laughs> when I first arrived in Hawaii, remember where I came from with Alan. And Klaus is a data sort of group. I arrived in Hawaii, got a nice office, and you didn't have personal computers or desktop computers. You had a room with a big computer in it and terminals that you had to go to the room. But there were a few people that had a dedicated terminal in their office. So Bernie Kolonsky, Klaus's data manager, comes into my office. He goes, oh, he says, he says you're, you're pretty, you must be pretty hot. Klaus said to give you your own terminal. I said, oh, okay. So he puts his box, well, a screen, keyboard and a mouse. And, and I'm looking at it, it's just this black screen. I said, I said, yeah, so what do I do now? And Bernie says, oh, no, no, screensaver's just on. He hits a key or something, pops up, username, password. I said, um, what do I do now? And Bernie says, oh, right, right, I forgot to give you. So he gives me a slip of paper, looking at it. What do I do now? And he goes, have you ever logged onto a computer? I said, no. <laughs> he goes, then he, he actually whispers, he leans over this, does Klaus know this? <laughs> so, I said, it never came up, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, I had, a, I had a lot of learning, learning curve there. But this thing about the change in the tides um, year to year, I, again, it was just one of these puzzles. You know, it kept kind of coming back to it and back to it. And I finally figured out that it was what we call internal tides. And the, the modulation from year to year was due to the large scale ocean density structure. And so we worked out um, this from the tide gauges. And then I was talking to Richard Ray at a, um, one of the altimetry meetings. And I came up with an idea for how we could extract these things from the altimetry data, which is very different because you don't have this hourly time series 
uh, everywhere. And so we wrote a little GRL paper, one of these four, four page GRL papers, and we actually got the, um, the cover of GRL that month from being able to extract internal tides from the satellite altimeters, which um, was pretty innovative. This is the Hawaiian ridge through here, and we showed that there were internal tide signals emanating from the ridge going in both directions. A substantial energy, um, substantial part of the tidal energy budget, okay, which had been a long-term puzzle. And this ultimately, my friends um, in Hawaii still say there was a followed up Hawaii ocean mixing experiment, a $20 million NSF experiment that marking them, they're exaggerating, of course, but they say the experiment was basically, proposal was basically based on Richard Mine's paper. And I said, well, that's great. I said, I didn't get a dime. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was mainly a modeling and field study, so it's perfectly appropriate that I wasn't. But um, they have some wonderful results. And again, all this comes back to Klaus's little puzzle. Okay? So along the way, I met, you know, him, met Jeff Polavina. We did sea level from altimetry and tide gauges. We did work on turtles. We did work on lobster. Could I just say that, uh, that, uh, that he is the originator of Ecosim? Yep. Yep. And um, one of our, our first paper was lobster catch based on tide gauges. And we wrote this paper here. We found a relationship where sea level predicts lobster catch four years in advance. Um, which is pretty cool, but the, it was pretty easy to understand. The lobster are four years old when you catch them, and we were tracking the larvae. Okay, so we had a nice predictor there, four-year lead. And we did this and the little dots, and then we pr did a pr uh, prediction for five or ten years out. And then when we got a little more data, we showed the prediction worked. And um, all from just the little tide gauges. We worked on swordfish. I'm not going to talk about this much, but... Again, an eddy index has this ridiculous correlation. Of course, it only has five degrees of freedom, so don't take it too seriously. So we had lots of fun you know, doing uh, fish and sea level. Another thing that we did, um, using the tide gauges and the altimeters, we're trying to use altimeters now to measure things like global sea level change, where we're measuring a millimeter per year signal. Okay. from an altimeter that's 1,400 kilometers high. It's kind of a ridiculous way to go about it. So you want to be careful that you calibrate it very carefully, and that's what I developed methods to do that using the tide gauges. Um, this is Steve Neerum at his induction as an AGU fellow, which is mainly due to the sea level rise problem, which again wouldn't be possible if we hadn't been able to calibrate it, which was Klaus's idea again. Okay, So long, long history here. Does anybody recognize this guy? Sarah? <laughs> this is Don Chambers. <laughs> this is Don Chambers in his younger days. <laughs> so, this was um, a number of years ago before we hired Don here. Um, this is, um, the, this is a, a, a good story here. I'll take a minute. Um, I was doing this estimate here of how I'm, I'm telling the altimeter community they considered me a tide gauge guy in the early days, and you know, which is fine. But um, I was telling them the altimeter is drifting. Okay, this is uh, millimeters. This is time. So one year, it's drifted upwards by 15 millimeters, and they didn't believe that because the altimeter cost a gazillion dollars, and we worked on it a lot and hard, so it's got to be right. And I kept telling them it's wrong. And nobody believed it because they didn't think the tie gauges were capable of calibrating the altimeter. Um, Byron Tapley, one of the famous um, space geodesy sorts, came up to me at a meeting one time and said, Gary, you've got to stop showing this curve. It's making the altimeter look bad. And he said, you can't use tie gauge. He says, I saw a tie gauge once. It had barnacles all over it. <laughs> and I, I'm going, this is the difference between space geodesists and oceanographers. Um, so I'm telling Byron, I said, well, Byron, why in the world would you trust any instrument that didn't have barnacles on it? <laughs> right, Jay? <laughs> so, so then, there came, then there came the day where the, the French, our French colleagues uh, were, were looking, about, looking about this, and they were actually a little more concerned about it. So they went in and started checking some things, and they found, remember I told you how much I like computers? 
They found in the computer code, thousands of gazillion lines of computer code, one line where they were supposed to divide by this number and they multiplied by it. Just inverted a parameter. It was called now the algorithm error. And when they, they then said, but it's easy to fix, just add this curve to your, to the data and it'll be all right. Okay. This was not fit. This was, I took their curve, I took my curve, I took this figure and I emailed it to the world. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and the, and the um, tie gauge methods that I've developed are now a standard part of the um, CalVal sort of system for the altimetry. Um, so I'm going to finish up very quickly with, that's kind of the type of things that I do, but um, what am I doing now and into the future? Um, I have three projects currently, um, currently active and two more that are starting up now. There were proposals last year that were accepted. And three main things, Conti Oops. the um, continued Continuing the development of the altimeter drift estimation. You know, that's been an ongoing problem, and I still am um, trying to get that better and better. Mainly because we're trying to do more and more with sea level rise. Because now, instead of just trying to figure out how rapidly is sea level going up, for the purposes of planning, we need to know how rapidly it's accelerating. We need to measure acceleration, not just the rise rate which is a much, much more difficult problem, again, putting additional demands on the calibration system. Okay? So first question, one of the proposals is, um, can we even measure acceleration? That's the first question I'm asking. Just statistically, given the data, the limitations in the data, what are our detection limits? You know, we don't really know that yet, and that's one of the things I'm doing. Um, s separating volume change, the ocean sea level rise, the ocean volume is increasing. That's what we're trying to measure with sea level rise. The ocean volume is also redistributing, meaning the ocean is just sloshing about. Okay? We have to be able to separate those things, and that's a big question that we have. The altimeter drift estimation, the biggest error that we have in using the tide gauges to measure the altimeter drift is measuring land motion at the tide gauges. The land is going up and down at a rate comparable to what we're trying to measure. So we use GPS instruments now that are at the tide gauges to measure the land motion to correct for it. And the putting in GPS receivers at tide gauges was actually done by the tide gauge community. I worked through the GLOSS, the Global um, Sea Level Group, which I'm chairing now. And our main goal now is a GPS receiver at every tide gauge. Okay. And all of that's been developed on the basis of this. We're taking into account here tectonics. So I had to learn geology. So you know where you're along an active plate margin, you, want, you have to get your GPS receiver pretty much bang on the tide gauge. If you're in more quiescent places out in the middle of a plate, you can be 100 kilometers away. We're taking all those kind of things into account. This was Kara um, Doran's uh, master's thesis work. We're trying to get a paper ready on it now. Um, some statistics. Mark Merrifield took over for me at the University of Hawaii, and we've been um, colleagues since. And so this work about the volume change redistribution, this is a map of the sea level trend from the satellite altimeters. So millimeters per year, how fast is the sea level going up? These numbers are plus minus 15. Remember the global rate is plus minus three, is, I'm sorry, is plus three. So obviously most of the signals you're seeing in here have very little to do with that slow increase of the ocean volume. So let's look at um, this area here. We're seeing rates of 10, 12 millimeters per year. So when we look at that, we'll take this little area here, we'll just average the sea level and look at the time series. Let's have a look at it. And we see this, and that curve is actually a quadratic. It's a, it's a line plus the, the curvature, and it's very linear. The curvature is about right for the IPCC projection of about 80 centimeters of sea level rise by 2100. But do you believe the quadratic on that? <laughs> do you think it makes any sense? The other problem is when I say, can we even measure this? The other problem is, I look at this time series, and it looks more like that to me. It looks more like we have a step. And that step happens to coincide with the 97-98 ENSO event, 
But more importantly, it coincides with that was a change of state, a transition in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the large-scale structure of the atmosphere. These two models both fit equally well. Mark looked at the tide gauge record, the same area, going back further. <coughs> Notice something even more remarkable here. This is what's been happening for the past 40 years. And now this is what we're seeing during the altimeter period. So the big problem that we're doing, and it is very well correlated with the PDO. So the big problem that we're doing then is the big proposal that we have now, we just got started, is we're making a different suggestion here. We're trying to say, you know, this isn't just we have an extended La Nina or El Nino sort of situation. What we're saying is that you've all heard of El Nino, right? And La Nina is the opposite phase. We always talk about El Nino. From a physical point of view, La Nina is probably could be more interesting. La Nina is the high energy state of the atmosphere. You know, when the trade winds are stronger, the circulation is more intense. And what we're seeing here, another interpretation of what we're seeing is that the, at least in the tropical Pacific, the system has gone into a higher energy state. So, and it's not now fluctuating El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, La Nina. So what we're arguing is that even though this is a redistribution signal, it may very well be a climate change induced change in the background state of the ocean atmosphere, which is, a, which is a very new sort of idea. And we're looking at it from the point of view of the ocean atmosphere, the winds, the sea level, and also precipitation. Because hydrology changes are where we're really going to feel impacts of climate change. So I went a little bit longer than I was supposed to, but that's all right. And we have questions. This one always bothered me. Degrees of separation in marine science. Uh, he put up a picture of uh, Jeff Polavina, and uh, I used to be Jeff's boss's boss, and so uh, we uh, we have worked. You know, so I mean, you'll find you'll find that uh, all over marine science, it's a small field. So um, uh, my name is Steve Morosky, and I've been here for two years now at the University of South Florida. Uh, I have a couple of slides on my personal journey, um, the way. Uh, Gary did, and so I'll go through that. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the lab that um, we have set up here. Um, it's a little presumptuous for me to call it the Population and Ecosystem Dynamics Lab because obviously there's lots of population and ecosystem dynamics that goes on outside the small domain that we are creating here, so, but nevertheless. Um, so, let me see if I can get this right. Yeah, here we go. So um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the philosophy of the lab and then describe some of the projects that we have ongoing uh, with the students. So in terms of the foci of our lab, number one, um, because of my, my personal background, I'll describe in a minute, I'm very interested in the sustainable management of living marine resources. And so, so what we want to do is try to create science that somebody actually uses in the day-to-day -day world of, of trying to make management decisions, which are obviously difficult. Um, uh, our approach is to apply a variety of um, both modeling studies, data mining analyses of data th that already exist. Uh, I used to say in my former career, the, the cheapest data you'll ever get are the data you already have, and we have a lot. Um, and then uh, trying to augment this with some field uh, investigations and lab analyses. Um, one of the things that uh, I've really set a personal goal for is, and that is rather than being incremental, to be disruptive. And if you look at the word disruptive technology or the phrase, um, it, it doesn't mean to be a pain in the ass. It means that uh, what you want to do is actually do things that are out of the paradigm. And so one of the things that kind of is hopefully a, a theme through our work is to look at disruptive technologies. Um, obviously, the training of scientists is really important. And, and yeah, I see this as a personal goal of mine in the last part of my career. And then our point of emphasis, and I'll try to emphasize this, is to reach out to other people in the college in terms of other uh, types of disciplines. So the campaigns that we currently have ongoing, uh, population dynamic studies of species of particular management interest, uh, like Red Snapper and others, uh, develop some new in situ technologies to uh, get at some of these age old problems and things like reef fish stock assessment to evaluate the impacts of deep water horizon and all the mitigation efforts. And that's a, a major theme, not only for my lab, but you know, for the college in general. Uh, to analyze the efficacy of various fisheries management techniques, and in particular, the use of marine protected areas, uh, obviously important uh, 
um, not only here but throughout the world as a augment to the traditional uh, management and then uh, to conduct some ecosystem level studies uh, um, that uh, look at not only individual species and their placement in the system but some of the system dynamics. So um, our physical plant is a rather um, cozy laboratory, uh, 149F. Um, you'll, you'll recognize that that's down the dungeon hallway uh, uh, next to the loading dock and the walk-in freezers. And I did that by, by choice. Um, we have a lot of stuff that goes through the lab and it's easy to run it through there as opposed to putting it on an elevator and bring it upstairs. So we were able to rehab this lab which was in pretty dire condition uh, when I came here and so we've got sort of the what you'd find in a normal fisheries lab uh, in terms of equipment. But of course, you know, most of our physical plant is not here at the college itself where it counts. And so we've done a number of uh, studies uh, using chartered commercial fishing vessels and also research vessels like the Weatherbird. And that will, is and will remain a major focus in terms of what we actually do. Um, let me see here. Oh. Uh, but of course, um, the physical plant is not the lab. The lab is the people. Um, this is our crew of nine people. Um, they are involved in a variety of studies, including supporting the educational role of uh, the St. Pete uh, Science Fest. And we had a booth there where we did some really interesting things, I thought, with uh, uh, doing artwork and fish. Uh, we had a lot of visitors to the lab, and I think uh, we all had a good time. And we all wore the same shirt, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, so my professional journey, um, uh, uh, USF is my second career. Um, I've got all three of my degrees in wildlife and fisheries biology at UMass Amherst, which has, and it's interesting, um, when I started, um, these were departments of forestry and wildlife. Now they're departments of environmental conservation. So it's, it's a lot different in terms of the titles, the functions are pretty much the same. Um, my master's thesis was on um, a population dynamic study and movement study of uh, rainbow smell, which is sp a small anadromous um, uh, fish uh, that occurs primarily in boreal waters. And this, uh, Gary, was my first publication in the Transactions of the American Fishery Society. Um, we worked out a, a metapopulation uh, view of uh, rainbow smelt. Nobody ever knew that um, uh, basically in a large estuarine system, the animals would move around between spawning sites as opposed to them being unique sites. And this was you know, far earlier than mitochondrial DNA. And so we were able to figure this all out with, with a tagging project. Um, my PhD dissertation was um, at, a different, at a different level. It was a simulation study on optimal harvest strategies for mixed species fisheries. Now that sounds really familiar because that's the thorny problem that we have here in the Gulf as well. You know, when you catch one, you catch many. And trying to work out that optimality. My major professor on my PhD was a fellow named Jack Finn, who actually was one of uh, Gene Odom's students at Georgia, and so yeah, an excellent modeler. Um, just in terms of my degrees of separation, my PhD advisor, my master's advisor was a fellow named Pete Cole. And Pete Cole, actually, he, uh, he's a fairly old guy right now, still alive, and uh, he wrote me an email about, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, and he said, I understand you're at USF. He said, I was one of the founding faculty at USF in 1956. And so he went on to describe to me, you know, uh, South Florida without air conditioning and other things that they had at, you know, when they started the campus. Really interesting. So um, uh, my <clears throat> first career was with NOAA. I worked in three locations, Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Most of my career is at Woods Hole. And then the last six years of my career was at uh, 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 Silver Spring, Maryland, which is essentially Washington, D.C. Uh, in terms of, so I started out as basically a field biologist, a working biologist, and ended up running the science part of the fishery service. Um, the last six years of my life were basically begging Congress for money, um, which I got pretty good at. Um, uh, obviously, when you have such a large enterprise, you know, you really require quite a bit. Um, I was, uh, in terms of the various projects one works on, um, I was obviously trying to uh, take care of all the problems that 2,000 employees generate, which is an enormous number of problems. Um, a lot of good science as well. Um, we were uh, trying to rehabilitate the NOAA fleet as far as uh, fishery studies go, and we were um, successful in, in starting that uh, rehab 
Uh, we uh, built five, uh, uh, 208 foot research vessels in something called the Dyson class, which includes a vessel called the Pisces uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And the, the newest one, the Reuben Lasker, was just launched. Um, I worked on President Obama's uh, national ocean policy. Um, I helped Bill Hogarth um, re, um, re establish the Magnuson Stevens Act and a variety of other things. So, um, but you can see that you know a lot of that is not a lot of this. And so I'm very happy to actually go back to the bench and do more science as opposed to science administration. So, um, and the, so uh, my students got a really good laugh at this, and I'm sure it has to do with the fact that they're really big fish. And, um, uh, this, this job will do it to you, I guess. Anyway, um, so I wanted to describe the projects we have ongoing. Uh, first one is, uh, this is Liz Herter. Um, she's working on a, what I consider a really interesting project. And that is, um, she's using information that we generated starting in 2011. Number one, to look at the age composition and the growth rates of red snapper. And you can see that these are the red snapper on the West Florida shelf. And they're primarily dominated by relatively young animals at um, say four to to seven or eight, uh, but you can also see that um, she's aged animals up to about age 36. Um, they're a very long-lived animal when you don't catch them all, and of course that's the point is to try to you know uh, reduce the fishing effort and fill out that age composition. And she has some growth rates. The question she's really ans uh, asking right now is, can you use the, um, the the thin sections of otoliths to look at the growth increments, particularly in the years when the Deepwater Horizon spill was overcovering uh, some of the range of um, red snapper uh, in the northern Gulf of Mexico? And I think yeah, she's got some pretty exciting results, and we'll see how that goes, how that progresses. But basically, um, measuring the increments in growth rate between you know the the age zero and whatever the age of the fish is, you can actually measure these increments with a uh, uh, image processing uh, image analysis system, and so that's what she's up to right now. And I think uh, potentially we could look at impacts on the growth rates of these animals, which of course propagate through all the population models in terms of uh, net productivity, reproductive output, and a whole variety of things. So pretty exciting um, study. Um, one of the um, really thorny problems that we're trying to work on is um, how can we assess the status of reef fish populations in a place like the West Florida Shelf uh, when you have so much of the um, shelf is in hard bottom that is resistant to traditional technologies like trawling. So if one goes out on the sea map cruises, for example, they do trawling, but they avoid a lot of these hard bottom areas, which in fact where most of the fish are, right? And so one of the pr projects that we have ongoing with the, um, with, um, the COT is basically to develop a, a new system to, um, uh, to index um, reef fish populations based on this camera-based system, or we call it CBAS, camera-based assessment uh, system. Um, our first objective is to fabricate a vehicle that is capable of uh, imaging down on, the, on these reefs, these hard bottom, hard, hard reefs that are out there uh, with uh, precision enough to discriminate the species and hopefully actually using stereo cameras to measure the fish themselves. And number two, to test the camera system um, in terms of some, uh, some pilot projects um, that hopefully um, we could actually result in a new paradigm in terms of assessing these stocks. So um, COT has been um, working on fabricating our vehicle. Um, the astute observers will um, see that this is the recycled zipper tow body, right? But we've actually, um, uh, and this is primarily Chad and Alex and Steve and, and Jim, have been uh, working on the electronics package here. And basically, uh, the key issue here was power and, and real-time video. So um, they worked out a, a system where the power can come down through the CTD cable at 750 volts and power the lights, the camera, the, um, the CTD that we have on board, a fluorometer, <coughs> altimeter, electronic compass, and all these things. At the same time, sending reasonable quality video back up the pipe so we don't fly the vehicle into the bottom. And so that was actually a, a real breakthrough because if we can figure that out, that means that we can tow this vehicle on virtually any research vessel that has a CTD. And so, you know, that's a big technological breakthrough. And so, so they're right now, they're sort of fabricating this camera system. Um, again, you know, it's based on the CTD. And our first cruise with the system will be in, 
in the late February. And what we're going to do is go up that um, Gulf Stream uh, gas pipeline, uh, which you know, a number of people know about, and certainly fishermen know about it. It's a lot of fish over the top of that pipeline. The idea is to test the vehicle and kind of get it going. And eventually what we want to do is um, use the vehicle to try to assess um, the resource status in and around these um, closed areas and uh, habitat areas of particular concern. So Sarah Grasty, um, my master's student, is going to um, look at um, the distribution and abundance of fishes in and outside these um, three uh, major um, uh, areas as part of her thesis project and in a cruise that if the vehicle doesn't flood and it works pretty well uh, starting in June. And so this really is going to demonstrate the utility of um, a wholly different paradigm to assess reef fishes. And if this, these two projects work, then what we'd like to do is expand that survey to the entire um, uh, West Florida shelf. Now when you think about it, um, what are we going to generate? Number one, we're going to generate a biomass estimate, and that's pretty cool for management. But you also get from the imagery the associations of individual species with the habitat types, right? And so the habitat types are quite variable on the West Florida shelf. Uh, with all the onboard electronics, you can also get um, the covariates, like the temperature, the salinity, and all the other things that you haven't been able to get at this level of uh, granularity when you do things like tow a trawl over three or four miles. And so potentially we could actually reveal a lot about the habitat preferences, fish to fish preferences, et cetera, of the species. So um, on the theme of marine protected areas, my PhD student, Marcy Cockrell, is going to be looking at um, uh, these three closed areas and, and in fact, um, a number of other alternatives. Um, partly looking at uh, uh, particle tracking simulation studies, and that is, um, if you were um, a red grouper and you spawned here, where would your progeny go? And so um, we're working with Bob Weisberg's group to actually look at the fate uh, of both sources and sinks of, of larvae with the idea that there's been a number of proposals in the Gulf of Mexico to site a network of marine protected areas, but never any linking function in, function in terms of the uh, hydrodynamics to actually understand where things would go if you had a network. And so, so putting that simulated together actually is going to be quite beneficial, I think, to the whole management process of evaluating you know, the, the utility of marine protected areas. And uh, another part of her study uh, is going to be using the high resolution um, satellite tracking data that are on most of the fishing vessels. And this is a similar study I published in 2005 using the tracking data. And you can see that you know, fishermen generally line up around the edges of, um, of these closed areas. So what does that mean for the economics, number one, of uh, the current economics and the importance of those closed areas, but also if we instituted any other closed area, what would it mean for the behavior behavioral changes of, of fishermen. And so what we, we found in this study is when fishermen lined up on the boundaries of the closed areas, their, their productivity um, in terms of dollars per day fish was about double if they were at you know, um, an extended uh, distance from the closed areas with the idea that these commercial species are actually spilling out of the closed area. And so uh, we're going to hopefully look at that on the West Florida Shelf as well. Um, one of the, on the ec ecosystem side, um, this is a, uh, a, you know, sometimes you do things that are incremental and sometimes you do things that are very risky. This is um, what I consider a, a real shot in, the, shot in the dark. And that is, there's been a number of studies on the West Coast in particular that, looks at, that look at anoxic basins. And the nice thing about anoxic basins is if um, fish parts float into them, they don't degrade. And so uh, there's been a number of uh, studies, particularly in the California current in these uh, anaerobic sediment areas, where they've been able to reconstruct the history of various species over a very long period of time in terms of their relative abundance. So what we're going to do is um, use a place called the Pygmy Basin, where the climatology has been worked out very well. And there's a history of some core sampling in there to see if we can look for fish remains, in, in particular fish scales, over, you know, um, uh, decades to centuries to see if we can look at the, do the dominance of various uh, fish species over time and relate that to the climatology. And of course, that's really important when we look at long-term uh, outcomes of both climate change and fishing at the same time. And so this is a collaborative project with Dave Hollander in the Paleo Lab. Um, in terms of uh, Deepwater Horizon, uh, I'll go through this quickly. Um, Emily Chancellor, who's um, uh, a retread engineer and now a biologist, um, is going to be looking at 
the data that we get off the CMAP surveys for ichthyoplankton, um, these are where the larvae of, in this case, swordfish and amberjack occur. And you can see that the blue um, um, squares represent the most abundant um, uh, places for larvae, the, the white, the, the less. The idea here is, you know, every species has a different distribution. So if you look at where the uh, CMAP um, stations are uh, relative to where the uh, surface oil was, um, and, you know, most of these are surface occurrences, one could actually look at the, you know, what fraction of the population of larvae was impinged by you know the oil spill and so hopefully come up with not only some calculations relative to deep water horizon but uh, in combination with Claire Paris at the uh, University of Miami to put together a simulator to say all right if we had an oil spill over here or down here you know what fraction of the populations would actually be impacted and we think that that would be a major contribution for the sort of readiness part of uh, responses to things. Um, one of the projects of emphasis we did, and this is a cruise we did with Dave's group um, uh, this August, is actually do some coincident or integrated sediment and fish sampling um, uh, studies. Um, this is a study that Susan Snyder in my lab is doing. And um, the, this is a fairly busy graphic, but um, the yellow dots uh, represent the relative abundance of a really interesting species called king snake eel. Probably most people haven't heard of it. A, pr a particularly nasty uh, species gets about six feet long and about 40 pounds um, uh, of nasty. Um, uh, lives in the in the mud um, around the outflow of the Mississippi River, and that's why the fishermen call them the mud eels. Um, the other species plotted here are tilefish, right? And so they tend to have a distribution that um, doesn't overlap the distribution very much of tilefish. And I think partly this is their habitat requirements, and partly uh, uh, probably agnostic behavior between king snake eel and pretty much everything else, um, nasty species. Um, this is a, a depiction of the burrows that um, uh, tilefish make. And so they make these, these rather you know, large uh, burrows, but you can see that the, the tapered part of that means that the fish has to actually go you know, head first into the burrow. Of course, king snake eels are also burrowing species, so our interest here is um, with um, oil being, you know, from deep water horizon being in the benthic sediments, is this a constant source of bioturbation to the extent that um, the species are continuing to pick up PAHs and, and, and other, you know, sort of toxic effects? And so um, her study will look not only at pH, PAH concentrations in bile and muscle and liver, but also for liver, liver damage effects, which would be sort of the toxic toxicopathic effects of, of the deep water horizon. So we're going to probably, well, we've got a bunch of samples from August and we'll do probably do another cruise next August to, to do that. Um, uh, this, so let me read this. Um, so all of a sudden, a number of Gulf fish are turning up with lesions, fin rot, and strange black marks. What makes you think it has anything to do with our deep water horizon spill? Um, this was an issue, I, I, probably people here have heard this to death. Um, there was a lot of um, anecdotal uh, reference to fish with a bunch of uh, um, unusual things. Um, uh, Bill Hogarth and I put together a proposal to actually get some science on this and it's interesting there w never really was a historic database on the occurrence of, of uh, things like skin ulcers and skin disease. And so what we did was did, um, originated a survey to um, to look for the presence of these these kinds of skin lesions that occur in a variety have, uh, resultantly have occurred in a number of different species, like red snapper, southern haken, and, and tilefish, and conger eel. These are some of our greatest hits here in terms of you know, what we actually found. Um, so in, uh, when I first got here um, back in 2011, we put together a survey uh, using the, the commercial fishing vessels, and we fished um, 500 hooks or five miles of long line at each one of these sites. And so this is uh, 84 long line hauls and about um, you know, so you can do the math in terms of how many thousands of hooks we were fishing out there, and a number of the graduate students here participated. Uh, you can see w one of the reasons why we worked down here is to try to set some kind of baseline of areas that you know clearly didn't have the, uh, at least we didn't, we don't think that it had the deep water horizon oil. And then in 2012, we were able to repeat a number of the stations. And if you actually look carefully, you can see that. Uh, we've extended, um, you know, our ourselves. We knocked out this part 
and then we've extended the, the sampling over to here. Um, the white um, stations were uh, stations we did with Weatherbird and the yellow um, with commercial fishing vessels. So in the two years, we've sampled 7,400 animals, about 100 different species, 150 longline hauls, and 60,000 hooks. That's a lot of cutting fish bait. Right? Uh,